Okay, so we're live. I'm just waiting for my phone to sync with uh, YouTube and Zoom. And then we'll be able to start. Yes. Yet. That's not the right one. Okay, I need one where I can see the comments. Oh. Ah, that's it. Okay, so we can, we can start. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> hello everyone, and welcome back to the Grand Multi Literacy event. Uh, so we're live. So the sound. We're live. So uh, feel free to leave any comments, questions. Uh, you might have also because I think Arabic is the language I'm the least familiar with uh, when it, it, um, regarding all the languages we had uh, in this event. So I might not ask uh, questions that you would be asking yourself uh, regarding teaching your child or uh, students to read and write in Arabic. So please uh, contribute, ask all the questions you want. So for this final session, we have two wonderful guests uh, who are Lina Holaki and Cynthia Kasparian um, to talk about teaching uh, diglossic and multicentric language that Arabic is. Um, so just for a quick presentation, uh, Lina is an Arabic language uh, instructor and consultant, <clears throat> and she has 20 years of experience in teaching Arabic, developing curricula and test material for national Arabic organizations and uh, training other teachers. And during her teaching years as Arabic language instructor for the University of uh, South California and Cal State University, um, as well as the Occidental College, she worked on enhancing students' engagement. Uh, so that's going to be a very key topic we're going to talk about when it comes to Arabic. and. For this, she uses various approaches uh, that combines visuals, music, gestures, authentic videos, and stories to motivate and prepare her students uh, for communicating effectively in the real world setting. And we also have Cynthia, uh, who is the founder of Hikayat. Uh, am I pronouncing properly, by the way? Yeah, it's right. It's Hikayat, but it's uh, really good. <laughs> So she's the founder of Hekayat, and she was born and raised in Lebanon. Uh, and in 2009, she moved to France and pursued filmmaking, so short films and documentary movies. And during this time, she immersed herself in the French culture and enjoyed the beauty and richness and freedom of embracing two identities. And in 2017, uh, her daughter was born and that is when her focus shifted to matters of transmission, language, uh, and identity. And because she's living in a monolingual city, uh, she had to ensure her daughter's uh, bilingual in, bilingualism in Arabic and French. Um, could that, that was her goal to raise her bilingual Arabic and French. Uh, uh, however, um, preserving her Arabic language uh, was quite challenging due to the lack of available resources for learning it. But uh, Cynthia took the matters into her hands and she started creating her own uh, multi-purpose games and toys in Arabic. So we're going to talk about your resources as well, Rolina and Cynthia. And that we're very lucky as well because uh, they're both giving away uh, resources. Uh, so. Lina is giving away a book and CD from the her storytelling based curriculum. Uh, and we're going to talk about why storytelling is so um, helpful. And then uh, Cynthia is going to be giving away a wooden um, alphabet game. Uh, yeah. And so um, make sure to, to enter the giveaways. All the details are in the program. I'm going to leave again the, the link in the description if you need to. But yeah, so that was the introduction. Welcome, Cynthia and Lina. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Um, and so, Cynthia, you're uh, joining us from France. Lina, you're joining us from the United States. So uh, <laughs> we're all here together, th thanks to the internet. 
Um, and so first, before we start, is there anything you would like to add to your introduction? I think it was pretty much well done. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Me as well, yeah. Thank you so okay. much, Yoshito. Thank you. And uh, so there are different forms of uh, spoken Arabic in the world, uh, like our viewers know already, uh, but uh, one written form. And uh, when we speak Arabic, and when we read a book, it's not the same uh, Arabic, it's like two different languages, so I, I guess at least two dialects, uh, they're, they're different. Uh, so could you please tell us first which Arabic you speak uh, in your daily life or, or naturally, uh, and how you go from teaching your child or students um, to go from the speaking to the reading. Uh, yeah, what are the first steps to introduce Arabic? Uh, okay, I will start. <laughs> yeah, okay, so sorry. I will start my experience as a mother. Uh, yeah. So when my daughter was born, I I just talked with her in, in Lebanese because yeah. I'm Lebanese, so I talked with her uh, in Lebanese. It's like the natural way of expressing my emotions and my everybody everyday um, uh, yeah way of being. And so I started when she was a baby. There was no problem. I started reading to her the Arabic books. It was okay. So she was she got familiar with the letters and the sounds. But then when she started growing up, uh, she started saying, "I don't understand this. I want you to read it in Lebanese." So for not, uh, I did not want her to to block on that. So I was like, okay, I started like translating it myself uh, while opening the book and reading it in Lebanese. And when I read the same book over and over again, I started in introducing the Arabic, uh, let's say the Fusha, the, yeah, the Arabic literature of the name. So I start explaining like, this is the way you say it when it's written, but this is the way we say it verbally. Um, so that was my natural way of letting her be familiar with the written Arabic. And when she blocks and tells me, I don't want it, I want it in Lebanese because I don't understand. I'm like, okay, no problem. Don't stress about it. But I start like trying to use my words in everyday life. For example, in Lebanese, we say uh, for the ladybug, we say coccinelle. Uh, but I started using like the dasua. In Lebanese, we, we mix a lot of uh, French or English uh, words, depending on if you are um, in an English or French school too. But I started introducing all my Arabic words in my everyday life. So uh, she does not feel like, whoa, there's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. Like once she told me, yes, in Lebanese, we say hi. I will, no, no, we don't say hi. <laughs> we say marhaba. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh. And so what about you, Lina? Well, uh, as an instructor and, you know, from educational field, I know I have for my kids uh, as well. Uh, but being as an educator, that helped me when I was raising my kids to use what Cynthia is saying. Instead of using my dialect, I am originally from Syria, uh, yeah. and we speak the Levantine uh, dialect, which is Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, kind of the same with different accent. Uh -huh. um, okay. So I choose to pick on the vocabulary that is within the sentence or the daily life communication. These words I pick to use my the written or the fusha, what we call the written and reading language in Arabic, we call it fusha, and uh, instead of dialect. So instead of saying sabato bot, that we talk about shoes, I say hida. So I say aina hida. Instead of saying aina hida uka, with all this heavy accents that we use or children read, I just drop these and make it very natural way. Aina hida instead of wain. So um, this build on having them when they went to school and they were introduced to reading, uh, reading and writing in Arabic, it was easier. That is having said that, if I'm talking to my child who's raised in Arabic speaking. However, as an educator, I receive many of students 
who are not descent from Arabic speaking household. And uh, they come to learn Arabic because due to their connection with the uh, religious or maybe the Quran, they want to read and understand the Quran. So uh, our other Americans who are interested in learning about Middle Eastern culture or for maybe college that they are aiming to work in different, you know, sector that they need the Arabic to understand. And when you are at a higher level in a professional field, everyone, even back home, they twist and modify their dialect and speaking to more standard fusha that is, and we call it modern standard Arabic, that is not heavy accented and grammatically heavy. So, yeah. So you transition yourself and also labeling in the house as a parent, it will be very helpful to expose your children to reading and writing. Label everything in the house in these words that a kitchen, there is a cabinet, there is a drawer, there is a pencil, there is a pen. Things that are, there is toys, there is dummies, there is dolls, anything, label that with, in Arabic letters and have them, you know, look at it or when you point to it, saying it in Arabic. So it, help, it helps a lot. Okay. Well, so both of you, you, you took the technique of intro, introducing some pusha in the way you speak, uh, so Syrian or Lebanese, uh, is it something that's happening as well in Arabic speaking countries? Or when it's an Arabic speaking country, children just, just go to school and they start learning at that, that moment, that time? That is a very good question because children in Arabic speaking countries, they are introduced to alphabets. They are surrounded with the Arabic. However, if you think about it, they are introduced also to the fusha by looking at, let's say, some displays, any place they yes. go. These all written in fusha. They are not written in any dialect. And if we talk about dialect, Yoshito, we have 28 dialects in the Middle East. So which one we are talking about? If we go about North Africa, the Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, they have totally different dialect. Me, myself, as a native, it would be hard for me to understand if they are speaking uh, among themselves because they yeah. have different dialect. So when they use the fusha or the literature Arabic, we all understand each other. So your question is, yes, these children are introduced auditory with all the alphabets and all the sounds. So when they come to school, it's easier to introduce them to the alphabets and the reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Exactly like if you are in an sp English speaking country, children, they are not reading and writing at home. They only listen. You only talk to yeah. them in English. Mm -hmm. So they are so used to the words that you are, they are hearing. And that's why we go to, uh, and bombarding kids with listening before you introduce anything to them, uh, especially reading and writing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I, I would add something to that exactly yeah. because I, I, was, I grew up in Lebanon, so I never asked myself what's the difference. The, the link came very naturally. Um, I don't remember a time like my kids at, that asked me, oh, it's weird. It's written differently than, than we spoke, than we speak it. She never, I never asked that question, wow. but what I would say, I think it took a lot of time, a lot of years for me to relate into a book when I was a kid. It took me a lot of years to say, oh, I'm reading something that talks to me. And I think that the stories that were told and the way they were told did not speak to me as a child. I don't know if you relate yeah, to that, yeah. uh, Nina. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I hear you. I hear you, Cynthia. And I agree with you because unfortunately, the literature written for little kids or when we grew up, it's way higher 
in, in complex sentences. So for us as a children, we want something fun. When we read it, we, like you said, relate to your emotion, relate to your maybe an experience that you went through. Exactly. It was really written as a high literature. As what's up with this? I mean, why? I should read something that really give a high descriptive what you can say this is a very nice house and I'm for me as a six years old or seven years old I will understand but I mean beautiful house high in building uh, uh, sophisticated in the decoration all these addition it it throws off a child to read the child away from this experience yes. as if he's not he's not con um, not concerned yeah. He, he, yeah as if he's not in it so yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah, very I important know. i feel uh looking at my daughter to like uh, follow their steps make it step by step at first you will understand like this sentence and you relate to that experience a very simple experience of everyday life and then um, a, a better level you make larger sentences so yeah correct yeah it's actually i will tell you it's the arabic between fusha and the spoken it's kind of a a line that sometimes you go towards dialect or the spoken and sometimes with that depending on the situation depending on the uh, context that you are in and having kids really reading or exposed in Middle East to the Fusha, it's really easier, especially if they are exposed to Arabic throughout their life, 100%. However, Yushito, it's so interesting. Nowadays, a lot of Middle East countries, they choose yeah. to have their kids enroll in international schools. So you are experiencing a problem and dilemma in Middle East now, having these young kids speak Arabic. And I know it's a big revolution now among educators that I connect with my colleague. They said it's so sad that these young kids, they are fluent in English or French, depending on where, which international school do they go to, and they are not exposed to Arabic literature and fusha, reading and writing. They think uh, parents that, okay, they are hearing it outside, however, in the house, you see parents speaking to their kids in English, communicating. If I don't know if you follow TikTok and Instagram, all these influencers, you see them with their kids, they are speaking English. It's like, why? Why you are in Middle East? Exactly. And yeah, and yeah, yeah I, I, I join you totally. And I think the main issue here is that, again, we were talking about books, is that kids, whether they are small or they are teenagers, they don't feel uh, they have enough materials in songs, in books, in, in, in games where they can express themselves in Arabic. Everything talks to them in English and it's uh, or English or French, whatever it is. And it's I, I think it's very important that in our um, Arabic uh, language, we give them materials to express themselves, to share, to communicate, to make discussions. I think things will be different. And for now, everything that is in Arabic, it's um, as if it's something really, really high or something really not interesting in colors, in the way they are shaped. So this is where we need really to focus on, I guess. Yeah. Thank you very much. So because we're talking about books, I think we're going to jump straight into this topic. But so Lina, you have created a curriculum around storytelling and books. Could you tell us a bit about it? And so we, we've seen the problem there is. What does your curriculum bring into this and how are you bridging the, this gap? That's a very good question. I mean, through, uh, throughout my experience, when I start teaching, I start teaching the traditional way, which is alphabet. Throw the letter and give some words that ties into this letter. However, within two, three years, the same group of students, they were moving with me from one level to the second, third. 
I noticed that they were not able to retain any of these vocabulary because it was, didn't mean anything to them. So I thought about why don't me and another colleague, we thought, why can't we introduce all of this in storytelling line? Because storytelling, like Cynthia said, we need to engage the learners. We need to engage our children. We need to engage our student with the language by having fun. Once child, children have fun, they will learn so quickly and acquire in a higher speed. So we designed the, the curriculum around storytelling. Each storyline will be a story, a fun story. We make it fun in a way that we throw in animals instead of people. Children love animals. And starting any point in learning language, even you are learning Chinese, French, and I mean, scientifically, and um, studies shows that the first thing that you need to uh, engage student or learners with any language is by listening. So you keep talking to them. And that is the natural way. When you have your child at home, all what you do, let's go sleep. Let's go eat. Let me change you. Uh, are you hungry? Do you want to eat this? Do you want to eat that? So we included all this like in circles that what is the most important thing for any learner to know, their needs and their wants, their desire, they like or not. So we created stories surrounded this and we uh, add to that all the vocabulary that is needed, all the animals, all the colors, all the numbers, but in a fun way. So the story, it's repeatedly every line with a new vocabulary, repeat with new vocabulary. And it's actually um, based on recycling many times and actually kind of looping up. And that is the, the study that we based our curriculum on. So when you that, say, hmm. Sorry, when you say recycling and looping up, you mean like, so recycling the vocabulary so they, they're exposed to it several times and then exactly. making it more and more difficult. Yes. Yeah, okay. study shows that any language that you learn, you need to have enough at least 28 to 38 times that you see and hear this word in different contexts, in different uh, um, situations. So that will make sense to you because that one word doesn't only stand alone. It is mm -hmm. always with a string of sentences. So we did that, I mean, study exactly what word we are recycling, how many times, and you keep repeating it later within another higher level of vocabulary so students become familiar and using the modern standard Arabic the fusha, not the spoken dialect because we receive many students come from different backgrounds from different dialects and each one will use different uh, way of expressing some items or some vocabulary. So yeah, and, I'm guessing, and, so and songs, that, adding yeah. songs to the, and puppets and role play adds a lot mm -hmm. to the uh, uh, picture and, you know, the story. It's engaging student by showing them picture and telling. So it is written, but actually as an educator, you do not show them that you are reading it. You are telling them the story, although you are reading every single thing in, the, in that story. So, so uh, just two things. I'm seeing people coming in, uh, joining the live. So uh, we have Lina and Cynthia who are, I, actually I, I didn't explain, but I invited you too because you, uh, so you both teach Arabic writing uh, by in, in a fun way. So through storytelling, through games. Uh, so it's really um, yeah, a fun way to do it. And I wanted to have your input on this. Uh, so if, uh, our viewers uh, have any question, don't hesitate to ask them uh, and I'm going to pick them up as they come. Uh, just to, to ask you about the exposure. So you said, so it didn't have to be exposed several times. First, the, the thing I like about what you said is that they're exposed to the same vocabulary but in different ways. So with puppets in the book, etc. So it's in different ways. So it's not, it doesn't feel repetitive but it comes in several times. And mm -hmm. but I had a question. It's because 
Arabic, so the spoken Arabic and the, the written Arabic is different. Uh, when you say exposure, do you use just the fusha or can it be both your, like for example, Syrian for you and the fusha? Or, or do you mean just one, one version, one language? Uh, usually to at home, I will mix both of them. Yeah. Because I know that I am very comfortable with the, my Syrian dialect, but I expose my children to the fusha too. However, in educational setting, in the classroom, strictly only uh, fusha. Because that um, saying, we have too many students comes from different background, different dialects. Yeah. So I don't want them to feel that they are isolated because I'm using my Syrian dialect and they are from Egypt. Yeah. It's different dialect. So they will say, why I cannot understand what Miss Lina is saying. Yeah. No, yeah. it's all first half from the beginning. Um, really, really uh, uh, assuring that it's so interesting when I have, let's say, Indo-Pakistani uh, descent students, they are much faster in learning uh, the fusha. You know why? Because they've no. never ex been exposed to any dialect. Ah. So it is really, I get, uh, I, I, I had a hard time reteaching these students who comes from different dialect. When I introduce a shoe and I will say, this shoe is called Hida. They say, no, at home we say it's a bath. We say boat. We say kindra. All these three, four different. Huh? And you take yeah. time. It takes them time to relearn. Um, relearn. So it's like what they say. It's easier to teach than reteach. <laughs> so I uh, um, urge yes. all parents, if they uh, have the uh, 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 eager to teach their children and make sure that they will go to into reading and writing fusha comfortably use the really the appropriate words for each item you can insert your dialect in, in the sentence but give these items and these vocabulary their correct saying um, in word it will make that your child uh, easier. Thank you. And so what, one question I'm, I'm asking myself is, so when it's storytelling, you're telling the story, so it's speaking, but it's also reading. And just earlier, since you were saying that you were mixing a bit both so Lebanese and Fusha. No, uh, no, no. Sorry, what I'm you... saying, this is a story, one of the stories that we develop. So actually it's written in Fusha. What I do, I say, So I'm saying, like, I'm telling the story, I do not read, I do not put the book like that. I share the pictures and actually it, it takes time from a parent or a, a teacher to kind of familiarize yourself with the book and the words and the sentences. But this book has the way a lot you of pronounce it, the, where you put uh, pauses and the way you, you mimic it. Yeah. Your intonation, uh, it's totally different. And you engage the students. So you say, yeah. oh, uh, had a, is this a small or big elephant? I said, small elephant, sagir. So we go back. Oh, sagir. All right. Well, have you, um, uh, so actually, I'm re uh, it's written. So this is what helps the children actually, Yoshito, when they are very comfortable with the alphabets. If let's say Cynthia, she has the games and they are learning these alphabets, connecting and reading. When they start reading, it makes so much sense to them and they will be engaged more. And we base our stories actually on a prior knowledge. Children wants to know something. And then when they are exposed to the language, you will put the language in it. It makes it easier for them to understand. 
And I think you showed something, Lina, uh, there you engage your body. And this mm -hmm. is something I really, as when we go to a country where we don't talk the language, we engage all our body just to make ourselves understood. Mm -hmm. And I think, and this is what we do with babies also. We put poses, we, we exaggerated some uh, meanings. And with the first heart, this is what I do with my daughter. Uh, for example, for your question, I talk with her a lot of Lebanese. I, I try to do the effort uh, to sometimes use the, the Fusha uh, words, but I use a lot of Le uh, Lebanese, especially when she's back from school, I'm tired, I've had a long day. I just want to be very um, spontaneous. Yeah. And sometimes, she, usually she answers in French. So let's say talking with her in Lebanese is already work for me with her. But then what I do when I take a book, I read it and I put a lot of, in, I engage, my uh, my my body to explain dhahaba. So this means because in Lebanese we say raha. So dhahaba, mm. and I show it with my body. So she looks at me and she understands. So there's not a lot of translation to be done, mm -hmm. and I still respect the fusha. So yeah, like uh, this is why pop, I think this is why muppets are so important. Uh, muppets or puppets? Puppets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is why puppets are so important because with puppets you can exaggerate and this is the best way of explaining it uh, oh, yeah thank you um i wanted to ask you as well um so in arabic so i've done just two months of arabic so <laughs> i just have very basic knowledge but uh, i know there are vowels that you put above or under etc and that at some point uh when when children can read enough or they can speak enough they're taken away. Um, in the books you find, so not, not the books you have or um, or the books for children, but when they get older, uh, are these taken away or do you have maybe publishers who try to keep them for longer so that all the children can still read even if they are not growing up in a Arabic speaking country? That is a very good question. You know, I started by saying you need to bombard them by listening, listening, enhance, have them retain listening. So let's say a child who is learning or you teach a child or you tell your child, kita, 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 I mean, I'm saying English in Arabic, but it's kita, it's the accent that you're talking, it's kasra. All right, it's kita, not ka, not ku. All right, and you keep saying you are introducing the habit kitab, al kitab kabir, kitab sagir. This is small book. Let's say miqas, it's a scissor. That's something they use while they are doing all the activity. Miqas, 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 miqas. All right, so when they are reading this vocabulary, not only this, I'm saying all of the vocabulary that they introduce them. By time they have this retention long term, when yeah. they are starting to reading, even if they see ka, ke, ka, ta, a, ba, they will not read it katab. They will not read it kutab. If you have all these theatrical command, they will say kitab because that's what they learned. So mm -hmm. uh, the listening, that's why it's very uh, important what you are saying, that at the beginning, because we want to help them uh, sound it correctly. But however, for our study, we found out the students who are exposed to correct pronunciation from the beginning, they do not need these all theatrical mark or this uh -huh, accent. Okay. Uh, when they are reading, it becomes like comprehensible to them. And especially at the beginning, you always have that story that has picture. We are not talking about when they reach intermediate and advanced level of the language. They don't need anything. And all the books you see and all the stories, they have none of these uh, accents because we assume that you are really equipped with knowledge and retention of these words and vocabulary that is familiar to you. And maybe sometimes they add little accent if there is a ambiguous understanding between this word, because we have words like say, ala on and ali as a name. 
all right, or alay as a, a higher. So if it is in a sentence, I will add this to make sure that I make it clear to the reader that this is what I meant, it's on. Although in a context and in the understanding of sentence, it is obviously I'm saying it's something oh. on, but just to uh, eliminate ambiguity in understanding, you will add that, but not every word, yes. That's and a very I, good question. I, I wanna add something. Um, actually for a student also to get to this kind of level of understanding of the language, I think as a second language, when Arabic is not your uh, mother tongue in the country, or maybe you're not living in an Arabic country, it's very important uh, to give them purpose to learn to write and read. And actually, I think that um, many people talk a mother tongue, uh, a mother language in a country, they don't talk this language, but they lose it in the reading and the writing phase. Because I think today the, the most important thing is to give purpose and make it fun and make it like, I want to I wanna try this. It's interesting. Uh, the problem with the paper and the pen, it's very um, distant. It's very cold. We don't understand why should we do that. So I think this is also to get to this level of understanding. It's important to keep them uh having um uh we were talking about engagement to be engaged to make it fun to make it challenging to make it like a a, a time of um of sharing also not uh, an alone time writing and reading is a lot of an alone time but for it to be to become an alone time it has to be shared yeah. at the beginning and then you get at some point where you can do it alone and get picky for example you gave the example um, lena it's very interesting the ala ali ulay that can be funny you can do it in a funny way I, I do it with my kid and tell her oh can you see that how fun is that and make it like a, like a game but if you just say oh don't try that you, you wrote it wrong then it's blocking so it's just the way you approach these differences yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess we're going to come to your game after because it's, it's to do really with writing. Just before we go into this, I had a question just because I don't really know how it works. But uh, so there are different um, Arabic that are spoken around the world. Uh, when you listen to podcasts and I think news is in uh, Fusha, but what about podcasts for children? Is it in spoken in Fus? How is it different variations or different Arabic? It's different. It's different. If the topic is funny and silly and, you know, just having fun, well, it will be direct. However, most of the podcasts that I am aware of, they use Fus. Because we are talking intellectual and some content, we are not just joking around and have making fun, you know? Podcast is, brings out topics that is really simulate and, you know, make you think and, you know, engage in learning. So when it comes to learning in anything, in any mean of media, uh, podcasts, uh, TV, journals, uh, newspapers, they are all emphasized. Because I was thinking, you, you say it's, it, we children need to listen a lot and they need to be exposed a lot to be able to read. And then they don't have need to have the vowels because they can just know in context what it is. So I was wondering if there were resources, audio resources for children that were in Fusha that you would recommend. Yeah, um, it's not only listening, Yoshito, it's listening and speaking. These two, uh, there is four yeah. skills in learning language. The yeah. two of them, two of them, they are input <laughs> and two are output. The two input, which is listening and speaking, right? Listening input. Speaking is the output of it. And then reading and writing. So when we talk about listening, all right, the input, the reading is an input too. Because yeah. when we read, we, um, fortunately, we think that student won't read aloud, that is reading. No, uh, scientifically and studies, 
showed that when you read, you read yourself in your brain. So you are understanding. It's not you are reading aloud. Once you ask children to read aloud, you will uh, have them struggle. You will make them uh, think, I mean, mm. uh, yeah, uh, so afraid because how they are sounding. We want them to read to understand. And the second one is speaking is writing because the more you speak, the more you are more naturally lighting, uh, writing what you are speaking. So when we talk about enhancing listening, it's the oral skill, which is listening and speaking. So I'm talking to my child. I need respond from them. So I always ask with a question, yes or no, or asking question, do you want to do that? So they will give me an answer. And student in classroom, the same thing. Do you want to do that? Do you eat that? Do you like that? Do you don't like that? So they are interacting and engaged with the uh, listening and speaking. Then it comes the third uh, kind of skill, which is reading. Believe it or not, writing is the last skill that yeah. we need our children to, or our student to uh, learn because yeah. it's the hardest. Right, no? Yes, yeah. enhance this for several years. Don't be impatient, be patient. I, I uh, do a lot of consultation and training to teachers. I say, I spent three years with oral only listening and speaking with the children. With the fourth year, the children were like, like this, reading and writing, instead yeah. of a when, when hassle. They are ready, to when they them. are ready, they are ready. They have a lot of vocabulary. They have language to start with, rather than from day one, okay, trace the alphabet, trace the letter. Okay, copy these words. What does it mean to them? No, reading exactly. and writing <laughs> should be, yeah, it should be something they want to express, something like Cynthia said, they will read and they enjoy and laugh about, um, then you are really hitting uh, the best way or the best um, learners and uh, li long life, which we call it in our education, long life learners. We don't yeah. want it for a year or two. We want them to be eager to the learn more. Life. And yeah. yes, and look forward to learn more, yeah. Yeah, thank you. What you're saying is so important because I believe that the first exposure of a, of a kid or an adult to, to writing uh, will stay with him for a long time. And many parents are like, wow, it's great, he's writing, but in a forced way, okay, he's writing today, but will he be writing in five years, in 10 years? And for them to keep the sense, um, to keep the, the knowledge of writing, it has to make sense. And if you do it too soon, it doesn't make sense. So it will just be something forced. Okay, they will know how to rewrite what, you, what you're putting out there, but it will stop there. And this first contact is very important. And think about it the natural way. If you have your child born for three years, you will never yes. ask them to write, to hold a pencil and write on a paper. All what you do, you communicate with them. <laughs> and they start, I mean, there is children, and there is something that we all have to be aware of. There is a lot of st three, four stages. Yeje, he is a researcher, talked about, about learning language. First stage is silent. Your kids will use head or you know body saying or finger to point to things that they want so what you do you do not point back and give it to them you label that and say oh yeah. you want uh, uh, orange juice or milk they will point to milk okay milk milk okay mm -hmm. here you go whatever so it's actually a silent and they use a lot of their gesture Second stage is they will produce only one word. So you speak to them all day and all what they say, num num, <laughs> num num, <laughs> right? Oh, only so lectures. <laughs> and the third year, that is when you are hearing some production from your child, but very short sentences and mostly the most phrases that has been recycled at home. So they will say, 
I have, I like uh, orange. I like this simple. So what, why we are expecting our student or our children from <laughs> first year or second year to hold the pencil and write. Yeah. So after three years, they will go to school and in the school in preschool and pre-K, there is no introduction to reading and writing. It's only fun playing through play. They will expose them to a lot of more vocabulary, although they come with this language. We are not talking about second language. So it's for another still five years. Five years you are using oral. And now when we talk about another language, we right away, all parents, all other <laughs> people, they will ask this question. When is my child will read and write? Hey. He's five years old. <laughs> he needs another, yeah. And believe it or not, once they are really comfortable with listening and speaking, reading and writing becomes piece of cake. No and struggle. To, to follow what you are saying, the first words, let's observe what the first words a kid is writing. My kid, the first words she wrote is her name, then yeah. mama, papa. Yeah. Yeah. And then she thought about writing a sense, sentence to say, I love you. And then it grows up, but it's her words, what's most important to her. But when you introduce a kid and tell him uh, the kid ate an apple, he doesn't care. He doesn't care yeah. writing about a kid that ate an apple. He wants to care about something that's very important to him. Right. So it's, right. it's um, important to follow this intuition. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's so important to make it relevant for our children. Yeah. I'm just going to read uh, one comment from Uta Limacher-Rivolt, who is saying, yes, comprehensible writing and reading is so important. Thank you for mentioning Piaget, so for the for the research. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. It's, and I think what you two are saying is something that came back a lot in all the, all the, um, the interviews we've had, and it's really to nurture the emotional connection with reading and writing, to create a, uh, an experience that's really enjoyable, and also to be patient, not to to push them to start straight away. And exactly. like like you said, it's for speaking, we're waiting, we're patient. Why can't we be when it comes to reading yeah. and writing? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I would like to transition into so writing um, because uh, and maybe start with Cynthia because I think you created your game because you saw an issue and you thought, okay, we need to create something to create some steps to get children into writing. Do, do you want to explain the story behind your game and what your game is? Yeah, totally. So um, my kid was born, like you said, in 2017. I started talking to her naturally in Arabic, in Lebanese especially. And then for three years, she started answering in Arabic and we, th we started reading books in Arabic and everything was going in the right way, let's say. But then she started school. And as we are living in France, she started knowing French, making sentences in French, but especially playing in French. So this is when everything make a, made a difference. She used to come home, back home and play in French. And when I wanted to play in Arabic, she was like, no, 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 I play in French, my, my friends are in French. And this is where I started asking myself that actually she's fed up with the language that for her is just orders and everyday life. She wants something that touches her imagination, her emotions, like you were saying, and not just emotions regarding her parents, but emotions regarding the world to find herself. Actually, when a kid play, it's work because for, for a kid, he needs to play to understand how he's gonna react uh, throughout things that are gonna happen with him in the world. So this is why, as Lina was saying uh, before, it's important to have books that talk about their, um, uh, what's happening with them, uh, even eating, uh, I don't know, eating cake, preparing a cake with the parents, uh, receiving friends and how this all goes along. So when that started, I started searching for games in Arabic because I wanted to, her to associate the language with fun with imagination, yeah. with time spending together. And I did not find much about games. Songs and books, there is more and more, but games really, there's no much. So this is how Hikayat was born. Uh, and this is how the first game was born, because again, when we were talking about writing and, and reading, for now, I feel it's, for me, it was not enjoyable. 
to learn to write and read. And I was like, why wasn't it enjoyable? And now I love it. What, what happened in between? And this is how I created the 28 alphabets in, in wood. I was like, okay, actually, the alphabets, they are, a, they are a living creature. If we think about them, like kids would look at the word, they are living creatures. They are not something like in 2D, like just a tool. It's something for you, when you acquire a language, you acquire a whole way of looking at the world. And this is how I looked at the letters. So the letters, it's a, it's a game of vocabulary, but it's also a game of equilibrium. So it's a way of spending family time and having fun with your parents, with your friend, laughing and also having challenges. And also as an expat, because I'm surrounded by expats and, and friends, with parents that don't talk Arabic. So they were like, oh, I want to, actually, I, I did not learn the language, but now I wonder why don't I transmit it to my child? And I thought to myself, I said, it can be fun to learn it together. And it can be a challenge for kids. Kids are usually um, faster in learning than parents, but it can be really fun for a kid to do like, for example, the equilibrium game, and be faster than the parents and know more letters than the parents. And this is nice. So they will feel like, oh, I know more than them. So they will, they will be um, motivated to know more. Like they say, why do, why do all kids know everything about dinosaurs? The only reason is because they know, knowing what they know about the dinosaurs is more about than their parents. So they feel like stronger than their parents. So it can be a way of saying, oh, you are learning Arabic, but I'm stronger. When so you, yeah, when it's <laughs> fun and they're, they're interested in it, they want to spend more time and focus more. So yeah, it stays more in the in the in their heads. Yeah, and it's it's fun ways. Like for example, the other day I was teaching my uh, my kids why there are letters that are connected in two ways and why not. And I told her like you know the letters they they are friends. So they they spend they, they um, widen Stretch their hands. Yeah, they Stretch give their arms. But there are some letters that they are so small, they can only give their arms back. They cannot give it to the letter in front. And it made her laugh. And we, she started playing with it. And we did not write a word. The purpose was not to write. The purpose was to make it enjoyable. Would you have some images or something you could share? Or, or even the game, if you have it with you? Uh, yeah, I can show you. Uh, let's start maybe with uh, images. Um, yeah, I think I... Well, How can I share? share? Uh, uh, okay, I just don't know how to share it. <laughs> uh, normally, at the bottom, you should have a green arrow that says "share screen." Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I did not see it. <laughs> okay, so up. Uh, that's your, that's yeah, your computer. So ah, yeah. Are you seeing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, so, yeah. so we can see at uh, the equilibrium you're, you're saying. Exactly. So you see here the letters, they are put into equilibrium. So sometimes when my daughter started to know more and more letters, I told her, okay, you have to name the letter before you put it. At the beginning, she was just playing with it. And she did like, uh, I will show you another picture up. So here she was putting um, all the, the games she has that has this, this sound of ta. So tayara, kitar, kot. So this is also another way of playing with the game. Like you, you, you pick yeah. a letter and you have to find all the games around that has this sound in it. And then make it turn in equilibrium on the, on the game. Exactly. So you can each time like uh, stronger the challenge, make it, uh, make it uh, harder for you. For, let nice. me show you. It becomes oh. like a, yeah, it's not just a letter, it becomes like a toy as well. Uh, actually, yes, I, I will show you. So this is also, for me, it's important to show you this picture because I think it's, again, we were saying about emotion, it's important to just have fun. So here she just, she just played. We did not learn anything, but she played and she became very familiar with the letters. So today yeah. it's not that hard for her to write because it, She's, she's, been, she's been seeing them every day. Yeah, Is you it were, you a digital asking. game, uh, Cynthia? Sorry? Digital, digital game or it's a physical oh, game? Oh, no, yeah, it's a, sorry, it's a physical game. No, this is so important. It's physical and it's in woods. 
And it's a very, it's a natural because the, the idea is to uh, awaken our senses because when our senses are awake, we receive more and more. So um, this is why also the dots, they are engraved. So when the child touches uh -huh. the letter, he feels the engravement of this dot. Yeah. So it's in wood. This is the 28 letters of the wood with three bases for the equilibrium game or even to write a word. Now with my daughter, because she's um, she knows more, we do one word per week. So she chooses the word. She learns how to write it, and it's there in front of her for a whole week. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Remind her every day. Yeah. Like, like you know, I was saying, like labeling, but this is one word. It's the word of the week. <laughs> yeah. We, we all, it's so interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. And so just to remind us, for everyone, that uh, both Lena and Cynthia are giving away. Uh, so Lena is one copy of uh, a book of her curriculum based on storytelling. And, uh, and Cynthia is the game that we've just seen. Uh, before we finish, because we'll get into the end of the, the hour, is there anything you find is, would be important for, for people to know about uh, or to keep in mind when teaching their children to, to read and write? Yeah, I mean, maybe I would end with something, uh, Yoshito, that we talked about maybe earlier, choosing or picking the right and the fun book. Uh, here I have a book that is written for native speakers. And here is a book that is for non-native speakers, all right? And the difference is they are both for children books, okay? This is very simple. However, if you look as a parent, read the sentences, as I said here and started telling the story, please refrain from reading the exact sentences. If you want to use, you think it's a fun book that can bring emotion, can tie to an experience that your child going through, or are you just having fun and introducing different in a fun? Please read the story, but do not read the exact. Uh, the problem yeah. is, or yeah, the fault. The story. Yeah. So the story is actually not because just telling you, Shido. The storyline is a complex sentence. And that is what Cynthia said at the beginning that her child was saying, No, I don't want to say, say it in Lebanese. Because I bet you, Cynthia, when she was reading it, saying it in Lebanese, she is not making it complex. She uses the picture and she's just telling it. So even you are using fusha, do not read these complex sentences. They are so high and above the student comprehension. Use the picture. I even I, I used English books. And I just uh, I hide the, uh, the English here or I put a strip and I use the picture using very simple first half, uh, uh, sentences, but in the storyline. So it makes it more uh, comprehensible and more fun and engaging. That's I would say it. also one thing uh, about the, the letters. Do not say the name of the letter. Start with the sound. Yeah. I tried it with my kid. I, I believe some people are not okay with that because the old way of doing is like saying elef, ba, ta, ta. But with my kid, I, I said ah, b, t, t. And this really introduced her so fast to writing and reading. Yeah. yeah that's something that the, so we had a session English and uh, Greek this morning. They were saying exactly the same thing. So yeah. there's no point <laughs> teaching the name of the, the letter, but how to yeah. pronounce it. That, that facilitates the, the, I guess, the, how do you say? Position. It, it gets faster after. Yeah. And we have a comment from Uta who is saying it's a great uh, idea to have a word of the week. So to have a word and to get, keep it displayed, that's that's really nice. And because it's like a toy, it's nice to, to have it and she can go and play with it. Totally, yeah. Yeah, Arabic is a calligraphy, so it's nice to see it. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. That's very... Thank you so much again for, for coming here and sharing your experience and what you're creating to facilitate reading and writing in Arabic. Uh, I, I don't know much about Arabic, but it, it's really interesting the way you presented it. Me, being an outsider, I find it interesting. So I can't imagine how it could be for children. 
So thank you very much. And I hope it was useful for everyone. Thank you a lot, Yoshita. It was really you. nice. And thank you, Lina. It was really nice talking with you too. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. And thank you, Yoshita, for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences. And please, I mean, anyone is interested, you have the YouTube channel, have your children yeah. listen to it. If you have, I have my email, you can email me. Any educators need some help, I'm here to help. I love to help students and uh, to uh, really learn Arabic educators to enhance their teaching I'm welcoming anyone and thank you so much Cynthia it's nice pleasure meeting you and learning from your experience it's beautiful and I would love to have your set inshallah and thank you Shita for having uh, us uh, today and sharing our thoughts and experience yeah, it was so a passionate uh, discussion pleasure. thank you I'm going to leave your details in the description below. Uh, so for, for the people who are going to catch up or who are going to watch it after, you have the, the link to their websites and you can just click on it. And since you have your website in French and English, I left both links. So if French is your language, you can have all the details in French. If it's English, you can check it in English. Thank you very much again. Have a nice uh, day, Thank Lina, you. and evening. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Wish you Bye. the best. Bye-bye.